Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to Aviation Outlook on behalf of the Deans of Aviation at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. I'm Alan Stolzer, Dean of the College of Aviation at Daytona Beach, and I'm really excited about our program tonight and our special guest, the Honorable Robert Sumwalt, Chair of the National Transportation Safety Board. It's also my great pleasure to introduce our own, President Butler, who will then introduce our guest. Dr. Butler, let me send it to you, sir. Thank you, Alan, and uh, welcome to all of our viewers. You know, since launching our Aviation Outlook webinars, Embry-Riddle has hosted some of the most influential voices in the industry, from airline CEOs to the head of the FAA. And today's guest is welcome in two respects. He's a national policymaker and he's also an alumnus. Every time you travel in an airplane, a school bus, a train, a boat, and even your own automobile, you're protected by safety measures resulting from the National Transportation Safety Board recommendations. The NTSB is an independent federal agency charged by Congress with investigating every civil aviation accident in the United States and significant accidents in other modes of transportation, including railroad, highway, marine, and pipeline. And they, are, of course, are considered to be the world's premier independent accident investigation agency. The NTSB determines the probable cause of the accidents and issues, safety recommendations aimed at preventing future accidents. In addition, the NTSB carries out special studies concerning transportation safety and coordinates the resources of the federal government and other organizations to provide assistance to victims and their families impacted by major transportation disasters. For tonight's Aviation Outlook, the deans of Embry-Riddle's Colleges of Aviation welcome a very special guest, the NTSB's chairman, the Honorable Robert L. Sumwald. Robert earned a Master of Aeronautical Science with a focus on aviation safety systems and human factors. Since 2017, Mr. Sumwald has served chairman of the NTSB he has been a member of the NTSB since 2006. Robert has flown for Piedmont Airlines and U.S. Airways and worked in corporate aviation as well. For almost 20 years, he was an air safety representative for the Airline Pilots Association, chairing the Human Factors and Training Group. He was also an aviation safety researcher and consultant to NASA's aviation safety reporting system. He has written extensively on aviation safety and co-authored Aircraft Accident Analysis Final Reports, a really fascinating forensic account of crashes from major airlines accidents to the last flights of John Denver and John F. Kennedy Jr. We look forward tonight to a very informative, insightful conversation with NTSB Chair Robert Sumwalt. Alan, back to you. Thank you, President Butler, for that, and Chairman Sumwalt for joining us. Uh, this is really a great privilege for me. Uh, Robert, we have known each other for many years, and I always enjoy our conversations about aviation safety. Uh, we are in some crazy times right now, aren't we? we? We really are. And first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a real honor to, to be here and be a part of this very special series. So thank you. Absolutely. Well, you, uh, you have such a uh, rich background in the airline industry and safety, as Dr. Butler said. Uh, in research and publishing and many other areas. Uh, please share with our audience a little bit more about your background and, and how you arrived at the head of the table for the world's premier safety board. You know, I'm, I'm still wondering about that myself. <laughs> uh, I have to pinch myself occasionally and say, is this real? The fact of the matter is I've had a lot of people over the years, wonderful people who have gotten behind me, supported me, mentored me, encouraged me, and occasionally counseled me to do things differently. Uh, I would not be here at all if it weren't for those wonderful people. But I'd be glad to, uh, to go into uh, talking a little bit about how I got here, if you, if you like. I would love that, please. Alan, the truth of the matter is I got into aviation by accident. And uh, the truth is, yes, I had, like, like all of us, I had always had a fascination with airplanes. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, who doesn't have a fascination with airplanes after all? Um, but when I was 17 years old, I was, uh, it was during our Christmas break during uh, high school, I heard on the car radio that there had been a plane crash out by the local airport. So I thought, wow, that would be really neat. I'd like to go see that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I figured out where the plane crash, it, where it was. It was a King Air that unfortunately uh, claimed a few lives. Um, when I followed the coroner into this location, I followed his car and I said to myself, when he gets out, just follow him and act like you know what you're doing. And uh, by the way, that's a good tip for life. Just act like you know what you're doing. And uh, anyway, uh, they raised the yellow tape for him and I ducked in with him. And uh, there I was on the scene of a fatal uh, accident. I thought a lot about that plane crash over the next few days, next few weeks. And after school, once we got back into school, um, I took a friend of mine out to show him where the plane had crashed. Now, this is the part that's a little fuzzy that actually makes no sense at all. But perhaps if you're 17, you can understand it. But on the way home from seeing where this plane had crashed and where people had died, what do you do? Well, naturally, you go by the airport and sign up for flying lessons. And that's how it started for me. I literally got started into aviation by accident. Mm. Uh, from there, I would, uh, you know, I got my private by the time I was through with high school, started college a few, few months later. And much more interesting than studying whatever I was supposed to study, I would go to the government documents library and, uh, and read aircraft accident reports and sort of had this secret dream that one day, one day I'd like to be a part of the NTSB. And so that's, that's sort of the long and the short of it right there. So I was, I was actually going to ask you if you had envisioned, uh, you know, while you were uh, serving as captain at an airline, you know, flying at, thir at flight level 350, uh, whether that ever ran through your mind that you might be at the NTSB and maybe someday leading it. You know, it was a dream of mine, Alan. I, I can't say that it was a goal. Um, and I think the difference is a, a dream is something you dream about, like that novel that I've been dreaming about for 20 or 30 years that'll never get written. <laughs> or, 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 or a goal is something that you're actually pursuing with action steps and you're holding yourself accountable. Uh, this was more of a dream. And, uh, you know, but nevertheless, I was still, still doing safety work for both the Airline Pilots Association and uh, doing some safety work for the company as well. And I was doing the things that I enjoy doing and, and it wasn't like I was doing those things to build a resume to posture myself to be better uh, positioned for the NTSB. I was doing those things because that's what I enjoyed doing and found, found interesting. Uh, but so, so the dream started becoming a goal once a friend of mine, Captain Bill Weeks, came up to me and uh, one evening and said, you've always wanted to be on the NTSB. There's an opening now. Now you've got to go for it. Hmm. The fact that Bill Weeks was there to push me, um, I said, well, gosh, if Bill thinks I can do it, then, then maybe I'll, I, I should go for it. And, and that is how I ultimately uh, started throwing my name in the pot to, uh, to be considered to be a, a mm -hmm. appointed by the President of the United States and con confirmed by the Senate. It's well, I'd like to probe that a little deeper. I, uh, how, does, how does one go about doing that? You uh, getting <laughs> nominated by the President, confirmed by the Senate, I suspect that's a very interesting process. Uh, maybe even arduous. Uh, what does that look like? So you you have an interest. Where do you go from there? Yeah, it's very painful. Uh, it's a very invasive <laughs> process, and I've been through it now four times because I've been uh, nominated and confirmed on four different occasions. Um, you know, how do you get the attention of the uh, of the of the White House? And uh, it started for me by going to my local one of my. Um, U.S. Senators from South Carolina and talking to him, it turned out that he was on the, on the Senate Commerce Committee, the Senate Commerce, Tri Commerce Science and Transportation Committee, which has jurisdiction uh, over the NTSB. Um, so that kind of got the ball rolling. I mentioned that a lot of people ended up getting, getting behind me. I got, a, got an interview with the, with the then Secretary of Transportation, Norm Mineta. Uh, mm -hmm. He got me in to, to meet his deputy. Secretary, I met with the Chief of Staff for the, for the DOT, ended up going over to presidential personnel uh, um, and, and getting a, an interview there. This was all because of Senator Mineta had lined all this up. Um, met with uh, Senator Ted Stevens, who was the, the head of the Commerce Committee. 
uh, met with a lot of people and uh, the White House uh, has you fill out more forms than you can ever imagine. Uh, the FBI does a background investigation that lasts uh, uh, way too long. <laughs> You don't know if you're going to make it through this entire process mm -hmm. until the day that they pick up the phone and call you and say, uh, this afternoon, the president is going to make an announcement that he's nominating you to be the, uh, be a, a member to the NTSB. Mm -hmm. And then you, uh, then the Senate wants to get involved and they have questionnaires that are just as arduous and you meet with Senate staffers, maybe some senators. And then uh, if you're lucky, you've got a Senate confirmation hearing. And, uh, you know, there are people that never even get a hearing. They, they, their, their nomination dies uh, and they don't get a hearing. So, you know, you want to get the hearing and you've got to get voted out of committee. And then finally it goes to the full floor of the Senate for a vote. Some people make it through he committee hearing, but they don't get the floor for a vote. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been lucky in each case, uh, very lucky in, in fact, but that, that's it right there, uh, sort of in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. It's a really fascinating uh, proposition, and I, uh, I just, uh, you know, to think about uh, how it just seems like there should be ways to streamline some of that uh, process, but the committees want different things, the White House wants different things, uh, and your, you know, your, your only task and, and responsibility is just simply to provide what they're asking for. So, That's exactly right. Yeah, so... Uh, You've been on the board for a long time now. I guess I'm wondering, has anything really surprised you about the position, uh, either as a board member or uh, your current role as chair of the board? What surprised you? You know, that's a really good question. And, you know, we try to keep surprises from happening. Uh, I can't think of anything that's really surprised me, any major thing. Obviously, the situation that we're in now with the COVID has been a surprise to all of us who would have ever thought this. My wife's, my, my daughter's in the healthcare business and she says, dad, they've been predicting this for years, but so maybe she's not surprised, but I think this truly has been a surprise. I think one of the things that surprises people, uh, not me, but surprises the, the general public is what the NTSB does and doesn't do. Um, they think that we are all things transportation safety. I had somebody write me earlier this week that he, while exercising on his pool deck, uh, some airplanes flew over uh, in formation and disturbed his exercise because the planes were making too much noise. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I wrote him back and said, well, um, hope you're doing well. And uh, uh, we are not the regulator. We don't regulate noise. We're an accident investigation agency. And uh, I did ask him, um, by the way, just out of curiosity, which was first, the airport being there or you're buying the house there? And I never heard back from him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think people think that I've had people talk to me about tired air traffic controllers in a certain air traffic control facility. Mm -hmm. And if we're investigating an accident where that might have been a factor, yes, we'd be very interested in it. But we are not the regulator. And we are really an accident investigation agency. And that's really what we do. And I think a lot of the public is, uh, uh, is, is not aware of that. They, they think we are everything re related to transportation safety. We're really an accident investigation agency. So let's dig deeper there too. So to, just to clarify that a little bit more for our uh, audience, uh, talk a little more about how the system works in terms of the NTSB's responsibilities and the FAA's role uh, in that investigative process and how uh, recommendations are addressed and whether they even have to be addressed by the regulator. Yeah, great question. As Dr. Butler mentioned, the NTSB by statute has the responsibility to investigate all civil aviation accidents in this country. So we are the accident investigation agency when it comes to aviation. Now, the FAA is the regulator, as I mentioned. So they have a responsibility. When they have a responsibility to, to look into nine areas of responsibility, whether it's airman certification, airports, uh, air traffic control, uh, regulations, certification, that they, they really go out 
and, and are a part of our investigations mm -hmm. to look specifically into those areas. So we're the accident investigation authority. They are the regulator. Mm -hmm. Now, with respect to recommendations, you're right. Um, our recommendations are just that. We have no statutory authority to enforce those regulations. We would issue recommendations to, say, the FAA, and then we would hope that they would, they would implement those. Um, they don't implement everything that we ask for. Over time, you know, over the 52 years, 53 years that the NTSB has been here, over time, they've, they've implemented uh, a little bit better than 80% of our recommendations mm -hmm. over time. That's not bad uh, if, we, if we think about it this way. Uh, if they implemented 100% of our recommendations, I'd say, well, we are probably being a little bit too, too easy. They're, they're doing everything we asked them to do. Right. On the other hand, if they implemented only half of our recommendations, I would say, well, um, maybe we're asking for things that are too difficult. The FAA does have a responsibility to do a, a, a cost-benefit analysis, and a lot of the things that we come up with um, have, have a cost that is determined to be greater than the benefit. Mm -hmm. so, so no, they don't implement everything that we ask for, but we keep pushing. Good. Well, let me poke the bear a little bit there. So the board uh, has recently been critical of the FA for not accepting some of its recommendations. And the example that comes to my mind is the uh, pilot records database. Uh, this was something Congress mandated, I think, 10 years ago. And now, and I'm thinking of the Atlas Air uh, accident. Uh, the board took the uh, pretty significant step of actually including the regulator in, uh, in the uh, citation of the, uh, as, as causal to some extent of that accident. Can you talk about that? Certainly. And I'll tell you this, Alan, one of the most disheartening things is to be involved in an accident and tell the family members that if the FAA had only done what we called four years earlier, mm -hmm. their loved one would more than likely still be here. Uh, and that's really what we're all about. We are all about safety. Mm -hmm. we, we learn from things so that they don't happen again. Right. And that's what our recommendations are based on. So you're right. In the case of Atlas Air, well, let's go back to Colgan Air, which, as you know, was February of 2009. Mm -hmm. we, we saw there that, that there was a captain who really had a record, uh, probably should not have been in the airline cockpit based on his prior record, which he failed to disclose some of which to Colgan Air. And he had a pretty poor record once he got hired. And uh, nevertheless, he made it through the system and uh, was involved in this horrible accident that was in part, well, it was a crew caused accident. He, right. he, he reacted inappropriately to, to a stall warning. In response to that, and we issued recommendations to tighten up the, what was the Pilot Records Improvement Act of 1996. In response to that, uh, that crash, uh, Congress, as you pointed out, passed uh, uh, 111 uh, HR, or, I'm sorry, uh, Public Law 111-216. Uh, which, among other things, uh, required the FAA to come up with a pilot records database so that a, a carrier or a future employer could simply go into this database and look and see what's Robert Sumwalt's record and see, you know, everything related to, uh, to that pilot. Mm -hmm. Congress mandated that in August. It was signed into law August the 1st of 2010. Mm -hmm. They funded... Four million, uh, six million dollars a year for the next four years for this pilot records database to be implemented. 2016 comes around and the FAA still had not made appreciable progress. So Congress became impatient and they said, well, FAA, we want you to get this done by August or by April the 30th of 2017. That deadline came and went. 40 days after that deadline, which Congress missed, the first officer for the Atlas Air 3591 applied for employment with Atlas Air and was hired. He too withheld 
critical information about his prior performance at, I think, four different air carriers. Mm -hmm. um, he got hired, had difficulty in training, but nevertheless got out on the line. And then February the 23rd of last year, he reacted inappropriately to something in the cockpit and basically pushed the nose down and crashed an airplane from 6,000 feet. Now, Congress or um, the FAA did, and I'm sorry this is such a long story, but I want to lay out how this, the timeline for all this. In March of this year, the FAA finally put out a notice of proposed rulemaking for the pilot records database. In their estimation, this rule will be completed in 2021 with a two-year phase in. So by the time this pilot records database is fully in place, it will be 14 years after the Colgan air crash, 13 years after Congress mandated it, five years after the congressionally mandated deadline, and four years after the Atlas air crash. This accident, this accident would not have occurred if the pilot records database had been in place. I'm referring to the Atlas air crash. It would not have been in place because had, they, had the FAA met that deadline, this first officer would not have been hired by Atlas Air. And so, as I mentioned, this is so disheartening to see an accident that could have been prevented if somebody would have implemented our recommendations. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what do you attribute the resistance to? in this particular case? Well, I've always said I don't make it a policy to, to apologize for other federal agencies. Uh, I think really the FAA would be in a position to better answer that. It, it is remarkable that it has taken this long to even get a notice of proposed rulemaking out for, for public comment. Um, so it's, it's just astounding. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think the FAA would be in a better position to answer that than I would. Have, uh, do you know, is there a cost benefit analysis included in the NPRM? You know, I, I don't know. I don't know of that at all. And uh, I've been through the, the front part of the NPRM, but uh, we're not interested in cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say that as a citizen, I can understand we do not want, as citizens, we do not want a, a, a government that is overly burdensome. Sure. I mean, I've been to a wonderful country where, where chewing gum is not allowed. Um, some might feel that's going too far one way. Um, so as a citizen, I think we would all agree that we don't want an overburdensome government, wherever we happen to draw that line. Mm -hmm. But as a safety official, um, we, we don't just make up these recommendations. These recommendations come from accidents where people have died, and that's what is the basis for our recommendations. Mm -hmm. This is what happened in the accident. This is what could, pre could prevent it. Now, therefore, we think you should do this. Right. Excellent. Uh, Robert, I'm wondering, though, that's a good example of the, uh, of the, you know, one of the issues we're talking about. Are there other areas that you would like to see the administrator be, or see the regulator, rather, be more responsive? What, what other things stand out in your mind that you think are overdue and need to be addressed? Well, let me say that we really do. I, I, the FAA has wonderful people that work there. Mm -hmm. uh, the FAA administrator called me at five o'clock yesterday afternoon and we spoke for, for 20 minutes about a particular issue. Uh, I have great respect, or great respect for, for him, the deputy administrator and, and the people who work there. But as a bureaucracy, uh, things do move very slowly. Again, maybe there's a reason for that, just to keep make sure that when the government actually imposes something, uh, it is it has been through a lot of vetting. I can understand that. Um, you know, one that really sticks with me, and it's because I, I went to the accident, was, as you'll recall, four years ago, there was a, a balloon, a hot air balloon crash in Lockhart, Texas. 16 people died there. Um, we found that there again, there's a pilot that has no business whatsoever flying, had, had been in jail, imprisoned uh, on, uh, I think, two or three times for, um, for uh, DUI. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, as, as we later found out, had multiple prescription drugs in his system, all legally prescribed, nothing illegal, but a cocktail of, of medications ranging from, ranging from opioids, ranging from opioids to antidepressants to other things, um, all again legally prescribed to him, but they would not have allowed him nor his underlying medical conditions to have operated uh, an aircraft, a hot air balloon in this case. The thing is, he's out operating a balloon for hire. He's charging people to fly um, in this hot air balloon. And, and so what we recommended and what Congress later um, passed a law on is for people who are operating, pilots who are operating, exercising the, com the privileges of a commercial hot air balloon mm -hmm. need to have a medical certificate. And again, we recommended that coming out of that accident. Congress later imposed it. Uh, we have not seen the NPRM on that. So uh, there are a lot of things, NPRM being notice of proposed rulemaking. There, there, there are similar things that are really frustrating and it is a bureaucracy. I think our, our I, I personally believe our rulemaking process is somewhat broken that it takes so long to either do something or to not do it. Mm -hmm. And I should say, uh, you know, this, uh, you and I have uh, both have the greatest uh, regard uh, for the FA and the great work that they do. And I've participated in a lot of that. And I know you have as well. And, and uh, it is a, it's a large organization and it is bureaucratic and probably doesn't move sometimes as quickly as we think that it should. But that said, the work that they do is, is excellent. And very highly regarded organization. So uh, just want to point that out and, and kind of get that out there because some of what we're talking about here is uh, are the safety issues uh, that depend upon the FAA supporting them and uh, enacting regulations that, uh, that uh, you know, put those safety recommendations in, into, uh, into actuality. Um, I want to ask you about safety management systems, which is something uh, you and I are both very passionate about. I was want you know, talk a little about SMS and maybe what we're getting right with it, and what areas of SMS still need some work and attention. Well, of course, you're the expert on this. You've written at least two books on it. Uh, well, and uh, so I do believe in safety management system um, systems. Um, I think that in my vernacular, safety is, safety is managing risk to an acceptable level. That's what, in my opinion, safety is. And so um, we do see that the, the major airlines in the United States, all part 121 carriers are required to do it, uh, to, to have in place an effective SMS program. Um, I believe in the FA, I'm sorry, the NTSB has said that, that part 135 carriers need to have an SMS program. And so we, we, we believe that as well. Uh, so that's an area right there where, again, we've called for it. That's been a recommendation based on several part 135 crashes. Now we want the FA to move and require it. Mm hmm and we have heard uh, over time that other certificate holders, manufacturing and design organizations, uh, certificated repair stations, uh, and others, even part 141 flight schools and 142 training centers and others, will ultimately uh, have that as a requirement. It, it just uh, does seem to be taking a while to work its way through the system. I'm sure as a as a safety professional, as a board chair, you would love to see SMS uh, make its way through the organization, uh, uh, the aviation industry, uh, perhaps more rapidly. Is that a fair statement? It, it is a fair statement, statement, Alan. And again, I understand that there has to be checks and balances to keep our government from being uh, too heavy handed. Mm -hmm. But once it's been decided, yes, we agree. And by the way, uh, the FAA did tell me that the acting administrator, when he was acting administrator, did tell me he was going to move forward, the FAA was going to move forward on this medical certificate thing for commercial balloon operators. Once the decision is, is, is reached, let's go for it. Let's put, let, let's start making it happen. 
Mm -hmm. So great. Good point. Uh, we've got a lot of new technologies coming out in uh, aviation these days, and we're looking at unmanned air mobility, uh, unmanned aviation systems, and so on. Uh, where do you see our safety vulnerabilities with some of these, uh, with some of these concepts and initiatives? Uh, what additional steps relative to safety would you like to see taken with respect to some of these emerging areas? It's, it's, uh, it's really out of our lane because, uh, again, we, we investigate the accidents. That might sound a little odd. Everyone else is trying to be proactive in the world, and the NTSB is by design reactive. We're an accident investigation agency. Really, those questions that you're posing are uh, really those for uh, the regulator, research institutions, academic institutions, uh, those those uh, are those types of standard setting organizations. Mm -hmm. Th that's really in their lane. It's not really in ours. But I can relate that to what we have done, and mm -hmm. that is in autonomous vehicles. We have investigated um, uh, several car crashes that have been involved in some semi-autonomous mode, and I've testified to Congress on that. And really the, the thing that I would say there is uh, there's great promise for this type of technology but it just has to be done properly. And, uh, I, and I think that, that, can, that same idea will translate over to the air mo urban air mobility and UASs and things like that. Mm -hmm. Good comment. Um, cockpit voice recorders, flight data recorders, they've made a huge difference in our ability to uh, determine causes of accidents. Those course are required in, uh, in major air carrier uh, types of operations and others. Uh, where would you like to see those devices? And again, I know that's more of a, you know, that's more of a, uh, uh, an FA question in the sense of regulation, but from the, in the sense of investigating accidents, uh, often you have very little data from operations that do not have DFDRs or CVRs. Uh, and of course, the uh, technology is improving with respect to that, the, and the costs are coming down. In what areas, maybe even in general aviation, would you like to see that technology? Well, you know, it is really in our domain because we have uh, we have issued recommendations in that, in that area. One of the things that we would like to see, obviously as an accident investigation agency, we want as much information as we can so that we can solve the crash. Mm -hmm. And the entire reason we want to solve it is not to point fingers, not to lay blame, not to assign fault, not to help the lawyers build their cases, <laughs> but really we want to find out things so that we can learn from it and keep it from happening again. That is our prime motivation. And so if we can't properly analyze it, then we might miss accident investigation opportunities. So with that in mind, we would like to see uh, onboard image recorders. Um, and I know that's a controversial issue with, uh, with, uh, with pilots, and I can understand that to an extent, but we, that's one of the things we would like to see is crash hardened uh, cockpit image recorders in uh, turbine powered non-experimental category, non-restricted category aircraft, um, because that's, that, that's what we've called for. We have recommendations going back in that area for, for many, many years. In fact, we have had some crashes that have had these Apario Vision 1000 or 2000 units, whatever they are, the Apario cockpit image recorders that we, that we would, would have difficulty have determining the cause had we not had those. So we, we know that they can be useful in, uh, in analyzing, properly analyzing accidents. Excellent. Um, I watched a couple of board hearings recently uh, that were conducted uh, virtually uh, due to COVID-19 and I thought they were really well done. Congratulations on uh, making that work. Uh, Tell us a little about how COVID-19 has affected operations at the, at the NTSB overall. Well, it's a great question, and it certainly has affected us. Um, 
you're right. We have done three virtual board meetings. Typically those board meetings would have been done in our, in our boardroom in Washington, but we figured out a way to do it virtually. Thank you to our office of CIO. They've given us the technology to, to do this. Um, the fact of the matter is we are not going to most, not going on scene to most accidents. Um, and that can be problematic, but nevertheless, the local law enforcement agencies are going to those accidents. They're taking pictures. In some cases, the FAA officials from the local FISDO are driving to the accident location. They're taking photos and sending those to us. Um, the on-scene portion of the investigation, so we're missing out on that in, in most cases, but we're still investigating those crashes. I mean, the on-scene portion for a typical general aviation accident might last anywhere from one to three days. Mm -hmm. And it's an important piece of the investigation, but it's more important on some types of crashes than another. If you have a mid-air collision, as somebody said a few weeks ago, the accident occurred in the air. It's mm -hmm. how it ended up on the ground that we would document if we went there, but we can get through ADSB data or from air traffic control data or through the witness marks because we, on the airplanes, we will later go back in, into a storage, to a storage facility and, and inspect the wreckage. It, it won't be laid out as it was on the day of the accident, but we can still see the witness marks. Mm -hmm. the, the point I'm trying to make is, is that no, we're not going to on scene to most accidents, but we're still investigating those things that we would normally do collecting witness interviews, uh, medical, uh, getting the, the pilot's background and history, uh, doing the maintenance records, mm -hmm. uh, air traffic control records, all of those things that we would normally do, we are doing. We're just not going on scene. Now, there is good news. Since our folks are not traveling uh, as much, we have completed since the beginning of the year uh, 981 accident reports. We've actually done 981 accident reports from January 1st to uh, the end of last month. Uh, our lab reports, research and engineering, they have completed 534 reports dealing with medical factors or metallurgy reports or CVR uh, reports. So we are getting a lot done in this virtual environment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and you're, you're doing much of that work. It's a different paradigm. Uh, and in many areas, we've all found, uh, found and discovered ways that we can continue to do what we need to do uh, with a high degree of fidelity uh, in a different model. And it sounds like, uh, sounds like you've done that within the NTSB. Uh, are you or other board members currently traveling by air? That's more of a curiosity question. Well, we, we, we're not going out and doing speaking engagements. Um, you know, we've certainly curtailed that. Um, uh, I, I flew, uh, flew back from Washington, um, back to my home in South Carolina. I flew last week. Our vice chairman has a, has a bonanza and he's uh, traveled from Charleston up to, uh, to Washington a few times. But for the most part, uh, we are not we're not traveling now. If there's a if there's a major accident that we really really need to respond to, uh, we will uh, put in place risk mitigation measures, and and we will we are postured to respond if something really requires that we get out there. But as I mentioned earlier, in so many of the accidents, it, we we really place a lot of emphasis on the on scene portion, but there's a lot more that goes on uh, behind the scenes. So. Mm -hmm. um, so not a lot of travel sure. um, I, and I've made a commitment to our employees. We made an address to them two weeks ago. Um, we will not put our employees in harm's way. And I know a lot of our investigators want to get out there. Um, but frankly, we not only have a moral obligation to look after the, the safety of our employees, but we have a legal responsibility as well. There was an article in the Wall Street two weeks ago that said that over 4,000 federal employees have filed claims against their agencies because they've gotten COVID uh, while being forced to work. And uh, I feel like my greatest responsibility 
uh, right now is to ensure the safety of our employees. Excellent. Well, one of the questions our students are so interested in, uh, and this is the vast majority of what I've asked you about or asked you to talk about is safety related, but uh, you know, we, we are facing a pandemic uh, of, uh, you know, very sizable, uh, having a very sizable impact on uh, aviation as well as the, as the global economy. And I've been looking at a lot of A4A, Airlines for America and IATA's economic forecast information. And I'm sure you and everyone else has as well. Um, so given that you're a long time aviation professional, uh, in the in the in the uh, airline industry and now the government, I'd be interested in knowing what you see in your crystal ball uh, as far as aviation's recovery. Uh, which areas bounce back first? Is you know your best guess of what the timing of that looks like? And of course, we know there are all sorts of factors and variables that can change all of this. Uh, but what do you see going forward? Well, of course, that's certainly outside of my purview as an NTSB chairman, but I'll, I'll share with you some of my uh, uninformed personal thoughts. Um, I started flying in January of 1974. We were going through an oil embargo at that point. I would go out to the airport uh, and talk to airline pilots while they were, uh, you know, in their one or two hour layover. And I'd say, I want to be an airline pilot. And they would, they would laugh and say, that's not going to happen. There's thousands of airline pilots that are laid off. We've got, we're just finishing up a war. Uh, we've got all these Vietnam pilots that are, um, that are uh, looking for jobs. So you can forget that, um, you know, but hey, I didn't forget it. Uh, I, I hung in there. Uh, we've, so we've dealt with that. We've dealt with recessions after recession after recession, including the Great Recession. We've lived through and gotten through as an industry 9-11. And now we're dealing with COVID. So based on the 40, 40 some odd years, they're not all odd years. Most of them have been very, very good years. But through the 40 years or so that I've been in the, in the business, gosh, what's that, 46 years, um, I've seen ups and downs. But in each case, the airline, airline industry, the aviation industry uh, has recovered. As far as how long that's going to take, uh, that's not for me to even venture to guess. But I am optimistic that there is a bright sunset, sunrise out there, and uh, and there's a great uh, a great future for people. It's just when is that day going to dawn for us? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, uh, I think you're indicating that uh, you would you feel uh, very. Uh, uh, positive that uh, that students at, at universities pursuing this uh, career path will ultimately uh, have successful careers. It's just the timing is unknown. Well, that's right. And how do how do we define success? Um, you know, I think the thing that was taught to me early on by my grandfather after I proved that I couldn't be an engineer and got <laughs> into got into another major. He said, uh, the main, the secret to life is to find something that you really love doing and do it well, because if you do that, you will, you'll have a good life. You'll, you know, you're doing something that you're enjoying doing. And, um, you know, can I guarantee that everybody that graduates uh, from uh, Embry-Riddle or any other aviation institution is going to be in the left seat of a major airline in five years? Uh, no, I certainly can't guarantee that. But I think if you're enjoying what you're doing, regardless of where you end up, you will have a very successful career. Again, however you define success. Mm -hmm. well, very sage comments. I have a lot of friends who are uh, airline pilots. Uh, not many of them are flying right now. Uh, or if they do, it's a very, very reduced schedule. And I'm told that they're not uh, fly, they're not uh, really getting any simulator time either. So I, I guess I will ask the, uh, you know, a, a safety related question again is, you know, are you concerned about that uh, from a safety standpoint when flying begins to pick back up? Uh, that we're going to have a workforce that is 
that perhaps has has lost some uh, proficiency, and you know, I personally I have not yet heard what the airline's strategy is uh, to uh, to address that proficiency gap. It's a great question that you raise, um, and you know, what are your thoughts on that? I think that uh, you know that is a it's a it's a valid point there. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I do think that, uh, you know, it's difficult for an airline to, to uh, fly pilots in an empty airplane. Uh, that's quite expensive. And at some point, these airplanes will be put back into service. And I should also say that the, the, uh, the public may have a perception that the, that the unused airplanes are just sitting and idling on a ramp somewhere, and they're not. They're, they've been uh, taken out of service by and large, and they're, they're unavailable uh, to the airline until the airline brings them back for, uh, for, uh, uh, for flying routes. So, um, but, and the simulators are, are occupied largely right now uh, for what's called displacement uh, training. So airplane, the airline industry is using this time uh, to streamline its fleets, to get rid of older airplanes and so forth. We read about that every day. And, uh, and that's, causing a lot, that's causing a training log jam in the training centers, getting these pilots retrained in a different airplane. Uh, so uh, following a, a, replace, a displacement bid process. So, so long story short is they can't do a whole lot in an airplane and they're limited in what they can do in a simulator. And I'm just, I'm, would be very interested in knowing, and I, I haven't talked to airline training people yet about what their strategy is for making sure these, the pilots are back up to the proficiency level they need to be uh, when they're given uh, routes to fly. You know, I'm glad I really turned the question to you because you really, this is your, this is your field there and, and uh, very interesting to get your perspective of that. Thank you. Um, well, uh, you know, uh, there's, we talked a minute ago, a few minutes ago about technologies. Uh, what are a few, what are a few of the more meaningful technologies that have happened in the last couple of decades? Uh, that have positively affected aviation safety from your perspective? You know, that's a great question. I've been out of flying for, well, airline flying for 16 years and corporate flying for 14 years. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I often say, Alan, that my greatest contribution to transportation safety is for me not to be flying these days. <laughs> So, um, so it's really not that funny, but, uh, but, you know, there's been so much that has changed since yeah. I've left the industry. Uh, you know, we used to do in a, in a jet dive and drive instrument approaches, you know, and so now I think through GPS technology, people are able to uh, basically uh, make, make just about every, every instrument approach, one that has vertical guidance. Is that, is that basically correct? Mm-hmm. And, Absolutely. you know, we saw figures from the Flight Safety Foundation from the Approach and Landing Task Force uh, back in the late 90s that the, the risk of a precision approach is the risk of having an accident in a, on a non-precision approach is something like, I can't even remember how many times, greater than a precision approach. So having that capability to eliminate the dive and drives, um, affordable terrain, award, terrain awareness and warning systems, mm -hmm. um, you know, nowadays you can have a Cessna 172 that basically has TAWs in it. Uh, before it was just the, uh, pretty much the airliners that had it or any turbine powered airplane with more than six seats, I think was required to have it. T tablets for being able to get information into the cockpit. Um, you know, I've got a weather app like we all do right here on this iPhone and let's see, you know, I, w I tell my wife all the time when we're, we had thunderstorms come through here earlier today, I would have given anything when I was in Los Angeles, I'm going to fly to Charlotte to know where those thunderstorms are in a strategic sense. So I could call dispatch and say, hey, we need to go up over 
Oklahoma, northern Oklahoma as, as opposed to Texas. Uh, you know, I'd have to get up and watch the Today Show to see what the weather was going to do. Mm -hmm. Having that capability, real-time weather information um, or near real-time weather information, uh, simulators for helicopters. That's something that when we, I chaired a hearing on helicopter, on EMS helicopters uh, back in 2009, there weren't a lot of simulators available for helicopters at the time. So I think all of these collectively, uh, and even though it's not a, a, say, a technology issue, back to your topic, Alan, is SMS. Um, you know, when, when companies can assess their Mm -hmm. Look at their risk, look at their hazards, assess the risk associated with those hazards, um, and put mitigations in place to control those risks. Mm -hmm. I think just that that idea is so important, and all of those things collectively, I believe, are helping make uh, aviation safer. That's a great answer, and you mentioned so many things there. Uh, the, uh, the apps we have for weather, wh whether it's these apps on four flights, uh, as you say, uh, there's so much capability on uh, on an iPad now in an airplane that probably exceeded the information you had in the earlier jets you were flying. Um, yeah. And of course, the uh, you know the uh, technology that we've introduced uh, that has greatly reduced CFIT, uh, controlled flight into terrain. So weather, CFID, all these things have been positively affected by ADSB, by TAWS, by you know these various technologies you've mentioned. So that's a that's a really it's a really powerful statement and uh, and something uh, aviation should be very proud of. Really, I, I agree. It's a good time, despite the COVID. It's a good time to be <laughs> be flying because uh, things are looking good from a safety perspective. The uh, NTSB publishes a most wanted list, has for many, many years. Uh, what, highlight a couple of those items, uh, Robert, that are related to aviation safety that are on the mind of the board chair. You're right. Most wanted list uh, came into being in 1990. Uh, it used to be an annual list. Now it's every other year. And, um, and it used to have about 23 issues on it. And we sort of figured, how do you effectively advocate for that many things? If everything's important, nothing's important. So we narrowed the list down to just 10 items to no more than 10. It can be less than 10. And right now, there are seven items, seven of the 10 items have tentacles into aviation. Uh, there's one, only one, that is specific to aviation, and that is improve the safety of Part 135 operations. Uh, the others are relate to other modes of transportation as well as mm -hmm. uh, aviation. For example, distractions. That's a, that's a factor or a consideration in all modes of transportation. Medical fitness. Um, uh, fatigue. These are the types of things that are multimodal, affect all modes, including aviation. Excellent. We've had a lot of questions come in since we've been talking. So I'm going to... Uh, give you uh, a, a handful of those if you don't mind. Um, what do you think is the most difficult part of an accident investigation uh, process? You know, I, for me, so a board member, and, and a misconception is that the board member leads the investigation, and that's not true. Uh, I've been to three dozen uh, accidents in my 14 years, and my my role is really to be the public face of the investigation, to meet with the public, to meet with the to, I'm sorry to to do the media interviews, mm -hmm. to meet with the local officials, the local or the the elected officials, and finally meeting with the families. And it's that third element that for me is the most difficult. Mm -hmm. You're meeting with people who who have heard, have just received the worst news of their lives, and you're there to try to reassure them that we are going to find out what happened so that others don't have to go through what they're going through. Um, so that's really, 
Uh, that's my perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, that would that would certainly be difficult, and I know uh, board members and others have uh, significant training and and other things as it relates to the families and the media, and uh, uh, I'm sure that's uh, very welcomed by you and others in order to be able to handle those difficult moments. Um, another question from a, a student is. Uh, uh, what are some of the requirements, educational and professional experience desired for a candidate who is applying at the NTSB? Yeah, great question. And we are hiring. Uh, so far, since the pandemic has been declared, we have onboarded 14 employees. And I will swear in another employee virtually on Monday. And uh, so we do hire. Um, in various disciplines, it might be we're looking for somebody in our chief financial officer's office. It mm -hmm. might be that we're looking for an investigator. Uh, and those postings, those jobs are posted on USA Jobs, usajobs.gov. Now, what are we looking for in, say, an investigator position? Um, a wide background. Um, uh, many of our investigators uh, in, in the aviation domain have actually come from industry. Maybe they worked for an aircraft manufacturer um, doing something there. Maybe they worked in accident investigation for an OEM, but many of them do come to the board with prior experience. Maybe it was military experience. And so uh, it really varies. And uh, I, I will say that we're lucky that the NTSB generally does not have problems recruiting people. Mm -hmm. So um, um, we are, we, we, again, we are hiring. I've been at the board. So we will continue to need uh, talented um, um, new, new hires. And you have uh, internship programs as well, is that correct? We, that's true, and we, we've been very successful with it over the last few years. This year, of course, we did not have the internship program, but it's one that, uh, that, that I really appreciate that we can do. Let me give you a couple more. Do you think that the uh, NTSB being independent from the DOT is still relevant today? Absolutely. I think our independence is, is one of our greatest virtues. We have to maintain that independence uh, so that we can uh, call it the way that we see it without any political pressure whatsoever to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, here's, a, here's a tough one. Uh, what must be done to ensure that another Boeing 737 MAX incident never occurs again? Yeah, well, you know, um, as, as you well know, uh, that we were not the investigative authority for either of those two crashes. Nevertheless, we have been involved. Uh, we were an accredited rep to each of those investigations. Uh, I've testified to Congress either three or four times on this topic. Um, and, and so, um, you know, it really is, we, we issued six, seven recommendations that we felt needed to be implemented uh, to ensure the safety of not only the 737 MAX, but other airplanes as well. We felt that human factors considerations need to be uh, on the front end of an accident, uh, I'm sorry, of a, of a design process, that the assumptions that the manufacturer uses in certifying the aircraft and that the FAA accepts, those assumptions have to be um, valid. You can't just put a test pilot in a simulator and start the trim moving and see, see how that test pilot is going to respond. You need a cross section of pilots, people who will, the type of pilots who will be flying those airplanes. And I see we're very tight on the time, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. But, but you can't just simulate the trim, runaway trim or, or MCAS activation by, by the trim wheel moving. You have to simulate those conditions that could lead to an accident, like loss of angle of attack information. Excellent. Uh, we always ask our guests, uh, because of the, the caliber of people we have on these uh, webinars, uh, students graduating now are facing a tough time. What advice do you have for them? Yeah. Maintain the course. And um, it's back to what I was saying earlier. Uh, 
don't give up. Um, just have a good journey. Uh, enjoy the things that you're doing. If you set a goal, I do believe in setting goals, by the way, but um, just enjoy the ride as you're going along. I think it's the journey that is more important than the destination. And just, uh, just hang in there. And uh, I think that's probably it. That's great advice. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it has been a great honor. Uh, I want to thank you not only for sharing your thoughts with us tonight, but also for your service to aviation safety through all these years and really to our nation as well. Uh, you're uh, doing a terrific job as chairman and we appreciate your great work. So thank you very much. Alan, thank you so much for those very kind comments. It really is an honor to, to be a part of the NTSB. It's an even greater honor to be the chairman. We have excellent employees and I'm so proud of the work that they do. And government service overall, I think people tend to uh, kick and abuse government workers. <laughs> people write me letters all the time saying as a, as a taxpayer, they demand this or something. Hey, guess what? I'm a taxpayer also. And, uh, um, and, and so uh, we're trying our best to be good stewards of the tax dollars and to more importantly, or just as importantly, is to help improve safety through quality investigations. Thank you for what you're doing at Embry-Riddle. Uh, I value the education that I got at Embry-Riddle uh, greatly. I put a lot into it. And as they say, you get out of something what you put into it. I put a lot into it and I feel I got a lot out of it. So thank you. I appreciate that very much. And again, thanks for coming on tonight. Um, I also want to remind our audience about our next Aviation Outlook guest, uh, and that is Mr. Ben Beldanza, uh, who is the former CEO of Spirit Airlines for 10 years, I believe, and is currently on the board of directors at JetBlue. Uh, he's had an amazing career in aviation, and I'm really excited to get his perspective. Uh, mark your calendars for August 26th at 6 p.m. Eastern, and we will see you there. Thank you again, everyone, and have a good evening.